Most Olympics athletes get just one shot to perform and succeed on the world's biggest stage. Today, Olympics organizers in Boston took a second shot at explaining to a skeptical public their plan for how they and the city will pay for and stage the 2024 Games. The new proposal uh, runs more than 200 pages and includes a $128 million multi-layer insurance policy that they say limits taxpayer risk. It also spells out plans to build a 69,000-seat temporary sta stadium excuse me, in Widette Circle, which would later be converted into a park, and an athlete's village in Columbia Point, which would later become 2,700 new student beds for UMass Boston, along with 3,000 units of housing, shops, restaurants, etc. In all, Boston 2024 anticipates 8,000 new housing units, tens of thousands of jobs, and they'll all result from bringing the Olympics here. When you look at this plan, anybody who looks at this plan, if you can pull this plan off in a cost effective manner, and we think we can from every piece of data we've looked at, uh, it really will transform Boston. This creates jobs, housing, and opportunities probably bigger than any project that I've ever seen. Joining me now to talk more about the Olympics bid changes are Doug Rubin, Boston 2024 spokesperson. Good to see you, Doug. Thanks, man. Chris Dempsey is co-chair of the group No Boston Olympics. Good to see you, too, Chris. Thanks, Doug, Jim. starting with you, is there anything I missed in terms of the core things that you hope were, were announced today that you hope will start moving public opinion? No, I think, look, what we tried to do today was, was do a bottom-up, fact-based approach to this opportunity the Olympics. And what Steve Pagliuca and his team have done is take a look at this at every opportunity, uh, analyze all the benefits, and then lay out the risks and say, look, we think at the end of the day this is a winning plan for Boston. Okay, so even though we know you're not 100% happy, one step forward, maybe even two today, no? We're still in the promise phase of the bid. If you look at London, they promised 9,000 housing units and that at least half of them would be affordable. They only built 2,900 and less than half were affordable. It's easy to make promises now, much harder to actually deliver on these promises. What are the biggest flaws or holes, you think, in what you heard Steve Pagliuk and his team put together today, Chris? We were expecting to see a lot more about the insurance policy. There's a question about what, if, whether such an insurance policy can even exist. But we want to see real details. We want to see the policy, and we want to see the insurers that are offering to provide that policy. Here's what Steve Pagliuca, speaking of the insurance policy, had to say about just that. We have about $270 million of contingency. We have insurances at every project level and, 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 and many types of insurances. And then an umbrella policy that covers the rest of it. It's the most protection there's ever been for a games. And we think the risk is very minimal, but everybody can make their own decision. You know, uh, Doug, today at one point, another point, uh, uh, Steve Pelleyuka said two times as much spent on insurance as was spent in Chicago. I went and looked after I spoke to you on the radio today. They bought a, uh, a billion dollars of insurance, the guy Pat Ryan, who ran the Olympics there. You're spending twice as much. So let's assume it's even two, three billion dollars of insurance. London was cited repeatedly today by your boss, Steve Pelleyuka. London went 10 to 15 billion dollars over. So even if you can buy this insurance policy, what makes up the rest of the whole? Well, First of all, let's, let's talk about London. London went over because they made conscious decisions, the government made conscious decisions to do certain projects that, that they wanted to fund as part of the legacy for the games. That was a decision that they made as part of their games. We're talking about a very different kind of privately financed games here in Boston, privately financed with, the, with uh, bid with the uh, money we get from the revenue from the IOC contract, the TV contract, and ticket contracts that raise, is raised privately. How about the issue that he raised, uh, uh, Chris raised, this woman, I assume you're quoting this, Patricia McCoy, is a BC yep. law professor. The problem with cost overruns is they're virtually certain to happen. Insurers do not insure things that are virtually certain to materialize. You don't have a broker or an insurance well, policy, let's talk, right? Let's talk, let's talk you don't about have the, a policy, Let's talk right? about the insurance policy. Is that policy. correct? There, we have, a, we have three or four different ways to manage the risk, mitigate the risk, and it's important to lay that out there because sure. the insurance policy that Chris mentions is one of a multiple multiple layers of, of risk management that yeah. we've got. So first of all, we've got a budget that we've gone top bottom on. We feel very strongly about that. Actually, ends up with a two hundred two hundred million dollar surplus. We built in contingency fees ranging from three percent for the athlete, athletes' village to fifteen percent for the stadium as part of that budget. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, as well, we've also talked about private developers issuing surety bonds and other forms of insurance to make sure that if they can't finish the project, somebody will step in and fund that, not, not the city. But you haven't identified any private developers, right? We have not. That Nor insurance companies. The private, Is that correct? Private developers, would that be correct? Chosen, private developers would be chosen through a competitive RFP process run by yet. the city. 
we, we are in the process of hiring a broker now, an insurance broker, to go out and to, to, uh, to vet the insurance policy. You part. know what's central to this, one thing that Doug didn't just say, that Steve Pagliuca and Mayor Walsh and others have been saying all along, is this going to be a, a smaller scale Olympics. And they say it, the reason why this makes sense and is credible is it totally fits within this International Olympic Committee Agenda 2020. Sustainable, smaller, no white elephants, or at least fewer white elephants. So why under that new kind of approach is what he says not at least credible? Agenda 2020 is like the used car salesman that sold your cousin a bad car and sold your neighbor a bad car, but promises you that you're going to get the right deal. There's nothing in there that substantially changes this plan. It doesn't change the auction dynamic process where the IOC is going to award the games to the city that best suits the IOC's needs, not the city that best suits the own city's But isn't part of their needs to say we're not these extravagant sort of scam-laden operation and Boston's the answer? That smaller budget, smaller scale, as I say, no white elephants, which is really what drives people nuts. Why can't they be reforming themselves? Boston 2024's plans requires building the three most expensive Olympic venues. That's the Olympic Stadium, the Aquatic Center, and the Velodrome. We have to build them all from scratch, and the bid that was released today only has a location for one of them. Two of them, we don't even know where they're going to yeah, be. Yeah, what's up with that? Okay, where's the from, Aquatic Center? Where's the cycling is, thing? And I'll, I'll do respect to Chris. This is a, there's a lot of time, but he throws things out without kind of fully giving, giving the but full story. That part's true. There are two of the locations. But, are they, not but they are fully budgeted in our plans, and they're budgeted at the highest level. So we, what we have done is for the venues that we have not found a location for, we have estimates for what it would range from, and we've put the highest estimate in each one of that budget. So that money is accounted for in that budget already. We firmly believe that we're going to find locations that will be much less expensive than those that we budgeted, but we have already conservatively budgeted the highest. So Chris throws out a lot of that stuff, but in the end of the day, like we've accounted for that and we can, t we can talk about that. How about it, Chris? Their estimates are far lower than what those things cost in London. So until we see real evidence that they have a plan to do them more cheaply, it's hard to take that at How about this value. developing neighborhoods at Columbia Point ultimately become the you know, Olympic Village come student housing, which UMass Boston clearly needs, new neighborhood and with debt circle. What's wrong with that? You see the glossy images of that, and it's, it's very attractive. And frankly, the, the greater Boston area needs more housing. We need to do that. But we do not need an Olympics to make that happen. And we shouldn't pursue a path that has taxpayers at risk if those developments don't go according to plan. You know, I, I mentioned this to you on the radio today. Steve Lynch, congressman, said on NECN, no, no, we're not doing this at Wadette Circle. And you mentioned to me, well, you thought it was because of the, uh, the permanent nature of the stadium, and this is not going to be permanent. I read what he said. It's not. A, he says, first of all, he doesn't buy the notion that it's not going to be permanent. Two, he says they're far better locations. So when you have some resistance from the population and you have resistance from a fairly powerful congressperson, why do you even think, even if you're right about all the projections, you're going to be able to go ahead there? Look, I think what we've laid out is a vision for the city, a vision for Wadette Circle, and a vision for Columbia, the, the village at Columbia uh, Point, where we think we could actually leave a real legacy for the city. And we're willing to go out there and, can, and talk to neighbors, talk to the legislators, talk to Congressman Lynch, and try to convince them that that's the right Have you talked right to case. Congressman Lynch Absolutely. since he made that comment? We have talked to, since he made that comment? We've talked to the federal delegation on a number of occasions about this. We feel strongly. But look, we're out there talking. To, we, as, as you've seen, we've taken input from the community. We, we originally had beach volleyball on the common. A lot of people were upset about that. That was ridiculous. Would you we've, not agree? I mean, that was ridiculous. We've now moved it to a beautiful location in Quincy where there's an opportunity to restore ferry service there and to restore a park that is in disarray. Those are the kind of things that we're talking about here, is the legacy your, we can Is leave. your position that there's no such thing as an on-budget? The, the, is, is it sort of this blanket notion because of history, where there have been relatively huge overruns, yep. nothing they say is ever going to satisfy you because you just don't think it can be done, right, well, no matter what the evidence is? I think a big hurdle for us is the taxpayer guarantee. We should be asking for the same deal that Los Angeles got in 1984. No guarantee. No guarantee. Are we asking for that? We No, we're not. But I, Why I'm not? Just, it's not, it, it, the, the, the whole, every city has to sign the whole city contract. What Chris won't tell you about Los Angeles is that there was a very limited, they would only, um, they would only right, bid Tehran back in 1984. Right, Tehran and Los Angeles. Right. 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 This is an auction, and we're entering an auction with a lot of cities that are going to bid up the price and not get a good deal for Boston. Speaking of no tax but, but money. I just, I just want to answer sure. that question because I've heard Chris say that a number of times. We've got a plan that we think works for Boston. It's a strong legacy component of that. 8,000 units of affordable housing, 16% of the mayor's goal of 50,000 units by 2030. That's a significant impact But what impact if the private the sector city. doesn't come through, Doug Rubin? What do you do then? Who foots the bill well, for that? And, I, and that's another question. We have actually vetted this with real estate developers, with, with people in the, in, the, in the industries who feel this is a strong plan and we can deliver on this plan. That's, that, but what Chris glosses over is the potential benefits here and the potential opportunities here. A tax base at Wadette Circle, which is at but right now generates $875,000 a year, which could in 20 years generate 10 times that under this development and grow exponentially beyond that. 
that pays for teachers, it pays for schools, it increases the tax base. All of the things that Chris and a lot of the no-boss people they say they want, this is an opportunity to deliver on those things. He said well, one thing he says he wants is no taxpayer money, which is what the public says it wants. In March, your then chair said, let the public vote, there'll be a ballot question. We're, uh, today, uh, Paliuka said re he referred all questions on polling and public opinion to you. When are we going to see the ballot question? We're working through the numbers. We are 100% committed to having this on the ballot in November 2016. Which will say no taxpayer money except for infrastructure and federal money for security. We're working through the say? language right now. We'll, we believe that's we are committed to that, and so we are not afraid of that language. That's Very quickly, talking. last week on WBZ, uh, uh, your CEO, Rich Davies, said he would vote for the Evan Falchuk ballot question. It says what I just said. Mayor Walsh told us on Friday on uh, Boston Public Radio he'd vote for it too. Is your whole leadership team ready to vote for that question if they don't do their own? Well, we're very, we're very serious about it. We've been very consistent that there'd be no public money for the venues, the operations, or the games, and we would absolutely will stand by if that. If they agree to that, you basically go home, don't you? Well, I mean, we, want, we want the taxpayer guarantee to go away. So it's not just saying we have a plan that doesn't have taxpayer dollars. We need a hard guarantee that the IOC is not going to come calling on Massachusetts taxpayers and say, you promised us X, Y, and Z. And there, you know, on that point, this is the last point, Doug, you, sure. you would acknowledge this is not a limited, this is not a guarantee that Steve Pagliuca made today. What he's saying <clears throat> is, trust me, we vetted this, we are minimizing taxpayer risk as much as we can. There's risk attendant to any project like this. That's what he's saying. Not that there's no risk, but that we're hoping our plan minimizes. Is that Steve, correct? Steve Pellick has been very clear from day one when he took over that there is no way that we're ever going to say there is no risk. There, we, we believe that the benefits far outweigh the risk and that the risk can be mitigated in a number of different ways to protect the taxpayers and protect the city. Ultimately, that's for the governor, the mayor, and for the people of Massachusetts to decide. Fair enough. Chris Dempsey, nice to see Thanks, you. Jim. Doug Rubin, you as well. Thank you for having me. Be well, gentlemen.